as well. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the Social Housing Roundtable today. Uh, it's our second one of the year. I'm determined this year to try and keep more of an active role, uh, active kind of run of how many of these we ran. So it wasn't till just before Christmas last year that I didn't realise we did 48 last year. So to not do 50 this year seems... Uh, that's the target, but whether or not we get there or not, I don't know. Um, I see some new faces, and I see some familiar faces on here today. Um, my name's Matthew Baird, for anyone who I've not met before. Um, I've been doing social housing recruitment now for the last 10 years. This idea was born from the fact that during lockdown, none of you wanted to talk about recruitment, but I still wanted to talk to you. So we started putting these roundtables together and they've just kind of grown and grown, particularly last year. We had, as I say, we ran 48 of them last year and they're all available on the on the YouTube channel and things like that. But the, the feedback has been brilliant. Um, and I'm continually looking for new ideas, new topics. New, new things coming through. A couple of people in the room have actually got future roundtables set up with, which is brilliant. So nice to see some of you people as well. Um, but this one actually came through from LinkedIn. Um, Grant had put something, I'll get him to introduce himself in a moment, but Grant had put something on LinkedIn saying he's doing some research around AFB management in supported housing. Um, and a couple of people tagged me in it, which was great, <laughs> including actually Janine, who's in the room with me today, um, and said, look, actually, go and speak to Matt and uh, and also Eden Bailey, who can't make it today, but we've got an event with on Thursday, but I'll mention about that later. So without further ado, Grant, I'm going to hand over to you to kind of introduce yourself, where this kind of topic and idea came from, really, um, and just kind of what we're, what we're looking to discuss today. So I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, hi, all. So my name's Grant. I'm the North East Wales Area Manager for a Welsh homelessness charity called The Wallach. Um, so I cover um, housing support grant funded services and area planning board funded services from Wrexham all the way across to Conwy in the north of Wales. Um, in the in kind of my patch, then I guess so we've kind of got a mix of services, some more traditional floating support services um, and outreach type services, but there's also um, kind of a mix of emergency accommodation um kind of more hostile type supported accommodation and then dispersed supported accommodation um and I say as Matt has kind of mentioned already this was picked up from a LinkedIn post that I put up in across the region with me you know there's thankfully quite limited um instances of antisocial behavior but I was just looking to see what more we could do as an organization to support the people that are being affected by this um, I think, you know, the support professionals that we employ at the Wallach are, are, are really good in working in a trauma-informed way and um, providing, um, you know, working with individuals to kind of to help them, you know, toward a path more independent of services. But through reading some of the um, like antisocial behaviour investigation um, kind of, you know, the the, the um the kind of the complainant interview minutes and stuff like that, I was really struck by just how kind of um how drastically some people around some of our properties are being affected and i just started thinking about well, what more can we do i know that a lot of the focus around antisocial behavior is around the person that's displaying those behaviors um and you know and kind of yeah kind of helping them to understand the impact of them but i think we are probably quite limited as a sect in a, as a sector in what we do to support the people that are actually being affected by it other than referring them into you know kind of housing related support services um so yeah i put up that post just to see so i mean one of the things i'd heard mentioned was about um like restorative approaches which i was quite keen to hear some information on um, and I've, uh, yeah thankfully i've met with a few people now that are using it and are talking really positively about it I think in my, I'm not presenting myself as an expert here at all. This is, I'm, I'm, you know, it's just kind of a conversation really. I'm just looking to kind of get some help and some pointers from others that have more experience than I in this. Um, you know, I think in the, I mean, I've, I've been a manager of services for about five or six years now. So I have, um, you know, a, a fair amount of experience in managing supported accommodation. I know some of the, the things I know that are really important are around not just matching a person to a service but also making sure that the person is well matched to the community that they're being placed in um it's not always possible especially in wales with the kind of the move towards um uh, rapid rehousing um so yes yeah, so, i mean that's kind of that's I don't know. I'm, I'm shivering as well, actually. I know Matt's talking about how cold it is, um, which is probably not going to help the way that I put all this across today. Um, but yes, I mean, that's that's 
where this has all kind of come from um, and just wondered really what others are doing to support the people that are being affected by antisocial behaviour in the communities that, that we're all working in. Really appreciate it, Grant. And uh, please don't worry about shivering. I mean, goodness me, as I say, I think everyone's uh, having to save money wherever you can on the heating at the moment. Yeah. Just, I mean, compared to a couple of years ago, no one would have objected to putting the heating on. Um, I really liked this as an idea because when I, when I was running these roundtables, I sometimes we'll have someone come on who is a, very much a guest speaker who is a specialist in a certain area and, and who is someone who, I don't know, is, is bringing something to the table in that vein. And other times it is... I've got a discussion point. I've got something I'd like to bring up today. Can we have a conversation about it? Because actually, I think this would be really useful. And that, that's obviously very much where we are um, today. And, and that, as I say, thank you for bringing it, bringing it to us. In terms of a you know starting off point um, on the discussion, because I always feel it's useful to to kind of get going with it. I know that you've, you've mentioned that you've had a few different kind of conversations around the restorative justice stuff. What, what's working and what's, I guess, what are people saying they're struggling with? Um, so I think using restorative approaches between, between residents, so in a hostile type setting, I think, and I suppose, yeah, I mean, I, initially I, I come at this from a dispersed supported accommodation type model where you know where we haven't got a staff presence 24 hours a day where if something happens we tend to hear about it after the fact so we might you know if it happens on a friday night and we don't have staff working until the monday um you know we might not find out about it till the monday over that period you know a lot of stuff might have gone on and the people that have been affected by it quite seriously as well um but also the more I was kind of reading into this um the more I found out that actually using it in a hostel type setting which is a I suppose a condensed version of the sort of communities that around my initial kind of queries um using it in a hostel type setting we've some really nice um experience internally which i didn't know about at the time um where uh, in our services around keridigion on the the kind of you know midwest wales um we um i don't think we issued a warning in something like 13 months to residents so the starting point was actually i mean restorative approach um I'm sure there's people here who know much more about it than I, but from what I kind of gleaned so far at its core, it's just relationship management and trying to repair relationships when they've broken down. Um, and um, yeah, so over 13 months, that was the starting point. It wasn't, you've broken the rules, you must have this warning that you've broken the rules, but this is how other people have been affected by it. Let's sit down and have a conversation. Um, and it was really successful. Um, I say, yeah, they talk really positively about their experience using it in a hostile environment. I've not heard too much yet about how it may be used in kind of wider community settings, but also, I mean, another area that I'm quite interested in, um, and we've actually had some conversations with um, one of our external training partners, um, with a psychologist about this, is that sometimes as staff members um, working in residential projects, sometimes the reason for asking a person to leave is because of how seriously an individual staff member has been affected by an incident. So sometimes it's not necessarily organizational tolerances that mean someone has to leave. Sometimes it's just, you know, it's the safety and well-being of a particular staff member. And sometimes those behaviors can be really out of character. Mm. But then it's like, what more can we do to repair that relationship? So it's that is the kind of opens up a question and is I suppose of how vulnerable are we, how vulnerable are we as uh, professionals willing to be in that relationship management with that individual because it's quite um you know i think professional boundaries in many organizations is very much you know you have to there's a line and maybe talking about your own feelings and how you've been affected by something maybe just over that line or is maybe a little bit of a gray area so if anyone here is using kind of you know using restorative approaches or other methods in that area i'd be really keen to hear about those today Brilliant. I mean, if anyone would like to come in, please, please do. There's a chat function which you can use or just use the kind of raise hand uh, function, which I think I just accidentally turned off. There we are. Uh, use the raise hand function at the bottom because I know there are some people in the room who... And Scott will be revealing the results this New Year's May. Going to mute that. Uh, who, who are using the, uh, either using restorative justice or who are, you know, uh, are, are, are experts or knowledgeable about it. Um, is anybody kind of using it at the moment that would like to come in or has got experience in it that would be happy to kind of raise some of the points based on what Grant's mentioned already? Janine, fantastic. 
I thought I'd start the ball rolling a little bit while people are giving local question. Um, yeah, so I was just really, I was supposed to sharing a little bit of experience. So one of the things I've been doing more and more of this year is um, be acting as independent chair for Community Trigger, um, which as most of the people in the room will be aware, the Community Trigger is a, a legally required process that every area has to have to give residents the right to have their case of ASB reviewed if they feel that there's some reason why it needs reviewing, um, perhaps not progressed in the, the way they'd like it to, etc. And one of the responsibilities we have as a panel reviewing those ASB cases is looking at whether there's any recommendations that can be made around resolving. And very often things like restorative justice and mediation come up as part of that um, the, the sort of suggested recommendations in a case because of course it's really it's really powerful if we can get people talking to each other understanding each other better and coming to their own solutions rather than as prof professionals us enforcing a solution on someone so in the right circumstances they're you know they're absolutely uh uh, right and, and, and great tools to use. Um, I suppose the one piece of learning that I've certainly taken from um, acting as that, that chair is that there is still some confusion around the differences between mediation and restorative justice. Uh, and because of that, there's therefore sometimes perhaps the the less suitable option is being it is being opted for in a given situation. So, for example, you know, mediation generally speaking is is usually much more suitable where you've got uh, some level of dispute between parties. Something needs to change on both parties' side. You know, they need to come to some agreement as to how they're going to live together or live around each other. Whereas something like restorative justice this is usually more suited and I say usually because of course there's no um, hard and fast rules with ASB but usually suited um, more better where there's a sort of somebody causing the harm and someone that's being harmed um, so general rule mediation everybody needs to change and flex a little bit um, and then um, yeah RJ more that there is a clear person who's causing the harm and a, and a clear person who's being harmed by that um, and I think it's really important that the best local areas that are delivering the best possible services have access to both and I think sometimes what we've what I've seen with chairing those community trigger panels is that we try to shoehorn RJ as a solution when perhaps mediation might be better um, so I suppose that's just my I, I thought it'd be helpful to share that learning which is something that I've certainly picked up more and more over recent months Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And I think it is a really important to understand the distinction between that, particularly when we're looking at supported accommodation, exempt accommodation, because that in itself is very messy as well and actually very difficult sometimes to get to the, the real crux of, of where the problems are. We've had a comment there from Viv Bickham. We've used the reset way focus. Uh, we've used the reset way focus is on facts, what's happening, impact feelings and thoughts, you and others. And then what next? Oh, I've had something come up there. Uh, need to move on, used by restorative restorative engagement forum. We're all trained. Our focus just isn't just HSG though. Um, and I think this is this is something definitely is coming today, is, is exactly where that focus is and what's uh where our engagement is. Sharon, great to have you with us. Uh do please come in. Oh, thank you very much, Matt. Um just sit up. Another tool to consider is a good neighbour agreement, and I feel that this is something that is a real missed opportunity within supported housing. I've been doing some work in the southwest of England and in one of the boroughs in London around uh, hostel accommodation, and um, it's with with the YMCA's. And it's you know what? Uh, just to take it back a little bit, one of the um, one of the mindsets that I'm trying to change is where we accept a certain type of behaviour will occur just because of the, the type of accommodation. So, for example, noise. Noise can have a huge impact upon a young person who may be, who may be um, autistic or ADHD. Noise has a real impact. But if we can, to, you know, start to to begin to understand that the impact and make and provide quiet zones 
that have been agreed with that with those people that, that they have you know made this suggestion that I don't know the kitchen is going to be a quiet zone between the hours of seven and nine in the morning you know just throwing that out there but it, it, but this change is with the people they are making the suggestions instead of being told what to do by the professional all the time give them some ownership give them some understanding and going back to the impact you know share with it why we're doing in this and what is the impact and and good neighbor agreements are a, a you know it, it's a tool that is being used by some of, the, of those that are engaged in this little project now and it's really making a difference because the the people who are living there are owning it and those who have been through the service before they're coming back in to share their experiences and so that's bringing about change as well so ju just something else for you to maybe think about there absolutely great um, there we are. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, it's right. I was just yeah scribbling down then as well. I think good neighbour agreements is something that I've written into like a draft antisocial behaviour management policy with us. And the ones that I found online, they don't they don't look like they're collaborative. Some of the examples that I've looked, they look like they're prescribed rather than what yeah, Sharon is suggesting here. Yes, that's yeah, not the spirit so. of the good neighbour agreements. The good neighbour agreements are, the, are, are designed by the neighbours themselves. Yeah. And, and this is where over over time um, that that part of the toolkit, it's a bit like the ABC that, that, you know, they're often prescribed and that's not the spirit of them either. They should be done, developed with the person, with the neighbours and shaped and molded around them. And they should be reviewed. And this is where it gives them the ownership and, and those living conditions will improve over time because yeah. people are driving it who are living there that you know we work we work in that environment and we experience it for maybe eight hours a day and then we walk away we're leaving you know them behind, and it's what happens then um so that you know that that's that's where i'm coming from you, you know with these but yeah you'll have seen prescribed ones grants and it's all about having those engagement sessions with your uh, with the, the the residents with the neighbors because that you know this is what they are that they're, they're not people who are you know we give them the label sometimes service users but it's not it's their home it is their home so let's acknowledge that that this is where they live and ask ourselves first of all would I live there would I live in this environment you know uh, and you know if the answer is no to that then it's well why is that what, what what are the barriers for me and that's often you know what I, I will start off with these sessions with the professionals but with the, pe the people who are living there you know have those engagement sessions right what's working for you what's not working for you can we do some little tweaks how can we do that how can we make a difference but it's about bringing them on board and them being part of that journey i think that's really important sharon as well isn't it at the start of this i talked about organizational tolerances and then maybe tolerances that we have as staff and as professionals working in the sector for you know however long we have we've we know what those tolerances are and as organizations we have policies and procedures which which say those but i suppose for residents or tenants um you know kind of people whose homes are around some of these they this might be their first experience of antisocial behaviors they may not necessarily know what that tolerance is so that would that would be yeah i, I really like that thank you sharon and always remember just one last thing from me sorry i do go on but always remember your policy and procedure is a process that tells you what to do which in turn you tell them what to do there's we need to listen to the voices we need to listen and more and communicate better and yeah. um, so i'll be quiet no no don't be at all really really glad to to have people who are going to kind of come in and bring some ideas to the table and i think it's it's really important and certainly i'm going to bring in wayne now um and there's a couple of other points that definitely result kind of in some of the points you've made there so thank you very much wayne over to you yeah hi Matt. how are you doing you okay are you grant i don't know if you remember i spoke to you just before christmas i'm wayne from room match oh uh, yeah that's right yeah so, wayne from room match i've never known your surname I've worked. <laughs> i normally just put room match on the ticket at the top tonight <laughs> so yeah sharon obviously 100 percent agree in regards to obviously sense of ownership for me i came into supported accommodation exempt accommodation around about seven and a half years ago i own my own supported accommodation um, the failings that we could see was the entry into support. So when tenants was moving in with ourselves, they was generally told to come and live with us. We were seeing a huge disengagement of support 
bad community activities, um, non-payment of service charges, high damages to our properties, all potentially because the tenant didn't want to be there. We have then obviously worked and developed obviously roommatch.co.uk. Obviously, Matt Beard knows all about it. <laughs> um, so for us, um, entry into support is vital. So it's a given that sense of ownership before the individual moves into that property. So individuals, once they pick a property in a certain area with a certain bracket, their sector need, age brackets, the journey of supported accommodation is completely different. We trolled it on my own business. This property before we published and went live. Um, in the last two and a half month, uh, in the last two and a half years now, we run at one hundred percent occupancy. We're in no um, service charge areas. The properties are literally we don't have damages in there. The engagement for support is absolutely unbelievable because people actually want to be and have a sense of ownership of being where they are. It's a completely different um, ball game is what we've created now with Roommatch, ultimately leading into that um, entry into support. And I think that's about all giving that ownership back. Completely agree. And I think there's a that, that sense of ownership is something that's so, so important. I know you and I have talked about it enough, actually, is actually having a choice is, is everything. Um, yeah. And what I want to make sure we're really kind of nailing down today is that that does play a massive, massive part within ASB, um, is how comfortable you are in your own home. Um, but also then the knock on effect of the fact that people might be put into a community. And I know the idea, the overarching thing was today of, of that kind of supported housing impact on on communities as well as obviously the associations and where you support um that knock-on effect of someone being in a community they don't want to be in asb is likely to increase etc so it does really really play a part and and you know i'm a, a big advocate for for room matches it is going to good to good to see you here and, and good to get your surname uh just to bring you in as well Hello. Um, yeah, so um, at Sapphire Independent Housing, most of our stock is supported housing. And a number of years ago, we did find uh, particularly one of our larger hostels, a 93 bed hostel. We were have seen an increase in a lot of incidents and we reached out to an organization called Young Futures and they shared with us a response yeah. agreement for incidents that they would complete with residents um, following an incident just getting them to explore triggers etc and how they could be helped through instances and just kind of linked to Wayne's point and the points that were coming up before we found that this was very useful but also when we used it proactively in the conversation signing up residents so if we were having a particular conversation with them and it appeared that aggression or something might be a risk we proactively asked what the triggers might be, how they could be supported. And we found that that was a real game changer. And when we shared the approach that we were taking with the local community, because this 93 bed hostel was in the middle of loads of other residential streets, there was a greater understanding from the wider community as well. And that eventually led to a donation for a counselling service uh, for a period. So really just to share that as an anecdote around just reaffirming some of the points that have come up in terms of being resident-led when these things happen and also just um, taking a bit more of a trauma-informed care approach and trying to understand what might be causing the issues in the first place rather than a punitive approach. And on that note, I just wonder what anyone thinks on this call around just the very use of the term antisocial behaviour. I personally find it quite challenging. I know there is antisocial behaviour legislation, which means we can't shy away from using it, but just reflecting on the anecdotes that I was just sharing and taking a trauma-informed care approach, the language doesn't always feel appropriate. So I just wondered what others thought about that. And if anyone is using language that doesn't feel so institutional and is a bit more supportive where someone's conduct might just be as a result of an underlying vulnerability, I think we've started using the term internally in the Wallach um, uh, behaviour that challenges. Um, but uh, yeah, which does seem to frame frame it in a, a bit more of a friendly way, in a bit more of an understanding way. Certainly an interesting one. I was, um, I'm the chair of the Supported Exempt Accommodation Forum um, on top of a number of other things. Um, and something that came up on our meeting last week actually was this, uh, it's something that Jesse's mentioned there around trauma and around actually, you know, one of the gentlemen there was saying, well, we can put in all these policies, you can do X, Y, Z, but if you don't get to the root of the trauma, then you're never actually going to be able to get 
to the cause of actually what's causing the the behaviors in the first place and i imagine that's probably a massive challenge for for anybody working in the sector and and grant i know you and i have mentioned before that evidently you know trying to build those relationships no matter what tool you use is actually sometimes the hardest thing to find out what's causing the underlying trauma to begin with um so one thing I wanted to make sure I came up today was another question I got asked before. I don't mind who jumps in on it. I'd love somebody to. Uh, Sharon, you come off mute. Were you going to come in on that point? Yes, sorry. That I was just going to say, you know, I mean, a lot of it is, that it is a, and this is where your engagement, going back to that engagement and, and people having ownership, it's about sharing with people what is antisocial behaviour and share and the understanding behind that. Because yes, I, I, I hear you know what is being said there around the ante, but it is about social behaviour. You, you know, if you take away the ante, we're talking about social behaviour and we're talking about behaviour that impacts upon others. And you're absolutely right in taking that trauma informed approach, understanding what that what those triggers might be and why someone pushed. But when we um, when we, get, you know, receive that referral or, or you know, the, um, Boris comes knocking. I always say I always sorry, I just use Boris all the time Um, I still do. Can't get away from it. But when Boris comes and knocking on the door, you know, you know, I, looking for um, support with accommodation it's about finding out as, about, as much as we can about them and ensuring that we don't set them up to fail and so there's a responsibility there on us to prevent that antisocial behavior because if we're aware of Boris's triggers then we need we need to manage that placement where we're going to place them so maybe placing them next to and Katie I'm just using you because you, you, you're right there in front of me you're on the next one along after me but you know placing next to Katie who might be very sensitive you know to to some of the so, to maybe and I'm just, again I'm just using noise as the example here because she's sensitive to noise but Boris it, it plays noise it plays music to soothe him to get you know when he's at high got high anxiety then that's not going to be you know it's about ha having that understanding at the very very beginning to so we don't set them up to fail Grant is absolutely on board with that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think there's some, it can be really hard sometimes in support accommodation, depending on how you're funded and um, and set up. I know there was a service I was in a while back um, where we had a mix of uh, flats and houses. Um, they were for single people, couples, families, whichever um, whichever referral came through really. And I think there was one, um, there was one individual who had been in a flat um, there were near constant kind of complaints from people around that flat about noise, um, you know, kind of disruption. The resident had said it wasn't necessarily their fault, that it was a personality clash, so we moved them, but again, to another flat, to a very similar kind of environment, and um, where they had people above and below them. And again, after a really short period, the, the complaints started coming in again. Um, but then we looked at what was going on for this individual and we were quite lucky at the time because a, a house had just become available um, and we moved them to a house. And you know what? That was a massive difference, you know, where there was just that little bit more of, of kind of um, like, I suppose, insulation really between them and the people around them. And actually in quite a short space of time, they were because they weren't constantly being accused and of, of you know kind of antisocial behavior um, the relationships with neighbors was much more positive so they felt more embedded in the community and actually they, they, they successfully moved on from the service in a really short period after that and I suppose that kind of touches on what Wayne was talking a little bit about earlier and I think one of my original statements as well around like not just matching a person to a service which sometimes happens depending on how you know the your local authority manages the the kind of portfolio of support the accommodation sometimes the referral comes through for a particular property and you're told look you, you really need to house this person in that property um but then where you do have the option to be more person-centered with that kind of placement whatever you want to call it i think yeah really looking spending time with the individual beforehand to find out what you know, what area is going to work for them, what have they got going on in their lives, looking at the environment around the properties, the dynamic and maybe the buildings, if you've got, you know, one supported property in between more general needs. I yeah. think some really good examples in my in my personal professional experience with that, but it's just, it's it, it's not, they're quite limited opportunities as well. They don't always, they, they, they don't always come up like that, which is a shame. But it, it's about taking some responsibility as a professional about 
getting that knowledge, that understanding and building those relationships and encouraging that them, you know, to build relationships, maybe go and introducing themselves, you know, as a new neighbor, you know, but years ago we used to do that, you know, um, if you moved somewhere new, you ne- you'd go and say hello to your next door neighbor and say, oh, hi, I'm so, but, you know, we've lost that now. And more and more, since, you know, since since COVID and the lockdowns, we've, we've lost that, you know, that that um, ability to go and say hello to people. Um, I think that whole point, been it's really on the discussion from today is the term community itself has probably changed in meaning. And I think yeah. that would be definitely something for us to jump back to. But Wayne, I'm going to bring you in, then I'm going to Janine. Wayne? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't know if Sharon's reading off my script. So this definite setup for failure um, is, again, a massive part of obviously what we believe in. So we're all professionals in this room. If you hear the word, um, you're going to do a placement into a hostel, straight away you've got negative effect because of all the negative publicity. So straight away as an individual coming forward for help and support, and I'm telling you then you're going to go and get placed in a hostel that you've never, ever seen, straight away there's a, there's a defense mechanism which goes up um and again we want to try and come away from obviously the support compassion the hmo the hostel um give people the opportunity and choice just exactly the same as the private rental sector really but it's the private rental sector it's a public rental sector we've helped support um and that's what we need to try and obviously change the frame frame of mind with really i, I personally believe no, just to no, jump no. in there sorry matt it, it there's a stigma around hostels and we we need to change that perception you you know there are so many people who refuse hostel accommodation based around that stigma Um, absolutely appalling to live in yes you know that there is that that line between the two I completely agree Janine I'm going to bring you in then Wayne I'll jump back to you but Janine yeah I was just it's the observation that um we, we always tend to drill down to whatever kind of topic we're talking about around ASB, which is, you know, the the challenge that managing ASB presents for officers who who deal with ASB, because it's complex and there isn't a one size fits all because we're dealing with people who who all have their individual needs and circumstances. And it always just redirects us to the need that those people that are dealing with reports of ASB just need to be um, well trained and, and confident in, in knowing what steps to take because it's a really important role to have that can make a significant difference into you know the lives and well-being of, of all people involved and I think if you're an officer who doesn't feel confident in in your knowledge and in the decision making um then that can be really challenging for the officer as well. And dealing with ASB can also have, you know, a massive effect on the well-being and the resilience of the officers managing those cases as well. So it's just it, it it's always that really important reminder about making sure that the frameworks are in place for those members of the team that are dealing with ASB cases, that recognition that it is a specialist role that needs you know specialist training that you know good policies and procedures are really really helpful although you know they can't be overly prescriptive because there is no you know unfortunately with ASB there isn't an A to Z manual that you can use in every case that's going to get you to the answer but something that helps guide those decisions something that helps give officers the confidence to make those decisions because it is a really difficult job you know making sure there are those people that those officers can reach out to whether that's peers so you know linking in with other providers in the area and having kind of peer group discussions sharing what works what are the challenges etc conversations like this but also having kind of line managers and supervisors who who genuinely can provide the support um, in what is a very challenging role so I just think that sometimes you strip away the label of the web, these webinars and it always drills down to some common factors, which is not forgetting how much of a challenge dealing with ASB can be for the, for the officers involved and, and making sure they've got the right support frameworks in place, which actually also includes what Grant was alluding to, which is that recognition that antisocial behaviour towards officers shouldn't be tolerated and and the officers might need the same support that you might give a a victim or or, or a resident so not forgetting that part as well mm. Grant. what um what training would you recommend or are there, are there any kind of trainings uh training that people have been on that they felt was really positive i mean we've got so in the wallet we've um we've got trained mediators across the region with me and i know it's not a regulated activity but we pay an arm and a leg for to put them through a qualification in it so we've got two that are running across the north um at the moment and 
the for the first time we've got a dedicated housing management worker in the wallet which is is a new post that um that we made i think last they, they've been they've, they've been in post for about six or seven months so we're still looking really at the moment around um like the the kind of core training package for them um to be really curious if you know if um if others could share what training they've been on that they felt was really positive I suppose I should declare a conflict there because I am a consultant, so I deliver ASP training. Um, but I guess as an obje objective observation, the only thing that I would say is that I often find that organisations um, jump to wanting training on, you know, what are the ASB tools and powers? But in reality, and we're talking about like legal tools and powers, but in reality, a very, very small percentage of cases get into the courtroom. Uh, and actually what is very often more the success is us trying to prevent that from happening. So for me, it's that kind of focus in the training on, you know, really being able to embed effective case management principles within to case management processes. <sighs> So that we are intervening and that we're not having cases that are delayed by maybe misunderstandings. So, for example, a common one is um, officers dealing with ASB not understanding what the standard of proof is for ASB cases. So ultimately, they end up looking for more evidence than they really need to be able to take action, which can delay matters and then obviously cause dissatisfaction and, and also harm being prolonged. Um, so things like that. I would usually point people in the direction of sort of case management principles um, as a good starting point and certainly as a good induction. But as I said, I am I am coming from this from a slightly non-objective position because obviously it is my day job. But um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the 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 advice I would give, like not jumping into the what is an injunction, uh, but doing more around the on a day to day, how can we manage problems, problem solve, professional curiosity, really understanding what the problem is, diagnosing it pro properly, and then making that real informed decision about what the best way is to deal with it. Um, and particularly pulling in partners, because um, also a massive believer that you cannot solve the problem alone. Very, very rarely will there be a, sort of a, an ASB matter where one agency alone can deal with the problem so how who can help how do we get them engaged um you know how do we put together action plans that actually make a difference that move things forward you know let's move away from kind of talking shop partnership meetings to actually kind of action focus that really do make a difference you know the the link groups you mentioned janine are they do you know if that's specific to england or do you know if that crosses over into wales as well the what group, sorry? The, the link, the ASB link groups you mentioned, where people can refer to have their case, um, their ASB case reviewed. Yes, yeah, so that is in Wales as well. So okay. that's the, the legislation is in the ASB Crime and Policing Act of 2014. Um, I will give a plug out to ASB Help, which are a charity um, that are really useful. They do a huge amount of work around lobbying and campaigning around the community trigger um, as it being a tool to assist residents but actually also to assist practitioners as well. So when the community trigger was first introduced, there was a little bit of a feeling within the sector from practitioners that, oh, this is just another way to wrap us over the knuckles for not doing our job properly. And I think we've been on a bit of a journey with the community trigger. And what we've realized is actually there's some real benefits for practitioners. So if you're an officer, for example, who is struggling to get you know public health services engaged in a case then going through the community trigger process because it's a statutory process might be a way to get those partners to the table um where recommendations can be set and hopefully cases can be moved forward so oh yeah community trigger might definitely be something that's worth looking into and as i said there's a huge amount of information on um, asb helps website um they also offer quite a lot of advice to residents as well so some of the things we've talked about around self-help so sharon's absolutely right like encouraging people to talk to each other um, there's some really useful information on ASB Help's website around what practical advice can we give to residents about that. So, like, you know, if it's loud music, don't go around when the loud music is playing because perhaps you'll be angry and frustrated and you won't approach that situation in the best way. Deep breath, think about what you're going to say, you know, walk away if it seems to be escalating and not being a particularly productive conversation. So, yeah, some really practical advice that's out there as well that you can share with your residents. 
Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Sharon. <clears throat> Yes, just to add to all of what uh, Janine has just said, which I certainly agree with, but the, the one thing that comes before that in terms of your training is understanding what is antisocial behaviour and what isn't. Um, you know that that's that's you know some key training for for all of your colleagues from you know everyone who's coming into con into contact with that with that um, provision would be my advice because what one person sees as antisocial behaviour another one may may tolerate. Mm -hmm. Um, so you and you've really got to understand that and it's about understanding the impact and so having some training around using the risk assessment matrix because I know Grant from the work that I've been doing with supported housing that that is that isn't used um, people you know I'm coming into the these um, sessions um, with the people in the project and he, they're seeing it for the first time and that's a really important tool that we we should be using to me to measure the impact of that ASB to, uh, for that person and the wider community because often we only use it for the for the complainant or the victim but when we're doing those investigations and to establish if anybody else has been affected we should be using it then also to really get a good understanding and so that's what I'd just like to add in terms of your training. And again, it's not a, a sales pitch either because I've got a conflict also. <laughs> um, no, but okay. there's um, a comment made in the um, in the chat there from Jesse saying that they found ASB training for Resolve useful. And I think your point you've made that's really really important there, just probably bringing Natalie Sharon, is that I live in Birmingham. It is the hot spot at the moment for exempt accommodation, supported housing, supported accommodation, whatever you want to kind of call it, with so many landlords popping up all the time, opening up a new service, meant to be offering some kind of support, um, that support not necessarily being offered in the right way, but also then, as, as both Janine and Sharon and, and Grant have mentioned there, ASB not really being understood in the right way, what is, what isn't, what kind of tools and mechanisms need to be in place. And the problem we're having on that, I mean, I, I mentioned this to Grant before we came on the call today. Uh, there was a, a letter that came through my door, October, November. Uh, there's a, a new exempt accommodation opening up at the end of the road. Please sign this petition to make sure it doesn't happen. No news about what business was actually running it, what kind of service users were going to be there or anything like that. But because of the media narrative that in some ways is justified due to either a lack of experience in ASB or so much supported housing not being run properly and effectively by landlords who are literally there to make the money out of it. There is now the stigma, which I know has also been mentioned from a media side of it, that is being pushed out uh, continually, that actually supported accommodation is just full of people who are going to create a nightmare for your communities. And that's another piece that I definitely want to make sure we discuss kind of in the next 15 minutes or so, because it's a really, really important point when we're talking about the, the association of housing and, and supported housing in particular, and and the media and, and what people believe is going to be down their road because otherwise all that happens is and it's a bit like what main wayne mentioned earlier a new accommodation provider opens which we're desperately in need of and immediately every single person in the community who hears about it is hostile towards that when it joins yeah. uh, natalie i'm going to bring you in sorry if that was nothing to do with your point i just thought it was an important yeah. one <laughs> yeah, i suppose yeah. it's just to echo some of what's already been said around particularly on um Janine's point we um I manage our safe living team in your homes, Newcastle. So we manage general needs housing stock, but we've also got a number of kind of supported um, accommodation projects as well, but right from young people through to learning disabilities um, and across the board and have very different challenges in each of our kind of business areas. But I think I think somebody's mentioned it around the resolve training, kind of the approach that we take around staff training for the safe living officers is very much kind of the knowledge and the casework side of things and we found resolve really good for that so a standard our staff um after a period kind of wait till they've done their induction but then put them through the btec level three and like the community safety so they've got that really foundation and solid foundation to work from but what we're now working with is we've got quite a strong arm around our support and progression services and we're working with them around the rollout of pie and i think we talk a lot about kind of trauma-informed practice and working in a trauma-informed way but it's it feels like it's the buzzwords at the minute and how do we actually make that a reality for staff and make them feel like they understand what that means and what it is that we're looking at. So we're looking at rolling out of a training of training modules for that around. OK, so everyone's talking about pie and trauma informed way. What actually is it? And really being clear with staff around what that is, both for the customer, but also for them as a practitioner. Um, 
and thinking about like self-care and well-being for that practitioner so Janine's point very much working in the ASB world we know it's a really challenging environment for our staff and to be able to empower them to to do their work but also look after themselves and each other is really helpful uh, and then looking at what trauma-informed care actually is because I think there's a lot of misconceptions around that that if you work in a trauma-informed way that means that you're almost modicoddling our customers at times and doing things and actually some of that work is around how we set boundaries but how we do that in a way that is it's very much around communication and how we behave with people and treat people as humans and and not kind of as the, these objects that we kind of pass around our services potentially and you know, actually sometimes it's the behaviors that are often the issues not the person and we need to start changing some of the narrative so for us I think we're on a bit of a, a journey around that and it's an ongoing journey but I think it's we're hearing that that word around trauma informed and actually what does that mean and how does it how does it link in and I think a lot for me of the conversation today has been around kind of the traditional hostel host, hostel setting mm-hmm. I think for us some of the challenges around how we manage antisocial behavior and some of our more kind of niche schemes around those with the learning disabilities mental health that side of things because actually you know we know that there has to be that acceptance that those behaviors are going to be there but where things escalate the approach and how we bring in services and partnerships is really key and I think that's where we come across a lot of our stumbling blocks because it gets to a point where the risks become such that we then look at an action but getting partners on board can be a real challenge because often we need adult social care or whether that's mental health services to work with us around that and we don't want to be in a position where we're looking at kind of evictions and we very much avoid that at all costs but there is a time where we almost feel like we've been pushed down that route because of the the support that we maybe feel like we're lacking in from other services. So is it the other services themselves that you feel aren't working in partnership with you then, Natalie, or is it? The- I think it's an understanding at times for me that um, when we talk about individuals, obviously a lot of the time they're thinking about the the that person's needs and that that they need that they need that that placement, they need that support around them. And what we're looking at is yes, that individual's needs, but the impact on their behaviour on the community and those around them, and trying to get that understanding that. Um, sometimes you know we're thinking about how that impacts on those around them and the impact of those individuals so trying to get that overarching understanding of yes we want to work with that individual but we also and I think it was alluded to earlier how do we protect those that are living around them further because these aren't people necessarily mm-hmm. who would you know benefit so much around referrals to victim support programs but actually it's more around the impact that it's having then on their vulnerabilities because you've got people with lots of kind of different needs and quite specific needs having to cope with challenging behaviors from others and particularly in the ld field i think learning disability field can be a real challenge around that it really can i remember being on a podcast actually with marie jenkins last year and there's a gentleman who lived in a i, I won't name the the help the rp um but they lived in a service designed for um retired retired community was all great they then that company then sold the service to another service um, and suddenly he found that two people were removed in either side of him that both suffered from quite high level schizophrenia. Now, he was then obviously going, well, hang on, this isn't what has been in place, and this is massively affecting my my life and, and the way that I'm living, and yet, obviously, those people need support and housing too, so how does how does that have an impact? And Grant, I know when we were talking before about you know this, this topic as a whole, that element of supported housing and the ASB that comes to it is a really difficult minefield to try and to try and navigate sometimes. Uh, Sharon, I'm going to bring you in. So yes, it's just something to share with, um, uh, based on what Natalie just shared with the difficulties getting other agencies on board. But a practice that I um, uh, now strongly recommend to people is bringing uh, bringing to the table also that organisation that can support you. And this came out of some experience that I had many years ago with a gentleman who was um, anti so displaying antisocial behaviour, and, and and you know it it, it um, began at you, you know, it wasn't causing too many problems, but there was an issue, but then it escalated and he blamed it on his condition at the time, which was Huntington's disease. And I didn't know anything about that disease. So I got in touch with the charity and they um, shared with us understanding and learning, you, you know, about his condition. 
And, it, you know, uh, the, one of the top five to, um, learning disabilities is ADHD. And so there's another organisation that I go to, you know, for help and advice, because we are not the font of all, of all knowledge. And we really do need to have that professional curiosity around the, those partners who we involve. So ADHD, it's not, a, it's not a shout out for them, but it's just, you know, ADHD UK, you, you know, it's going to that and, and sharing with them some of the difficulties that you're facing and seeking their perspectives. I always find that that is a good, good, is a good practice to have on board, to think outside the box in terms of who you're going to involve so that you really tailor in that support, that trauma-informed approach, because it's about understanding and knowledge and we're better to go to the experts. Completely agree. Grant, any thoughts on, uh, I guess, any of the points that just come up in the last, I appreciate it, it's a huge deluge of information that kind of came from different uh, different avenues there, but in terms of, I guess, your services or, or thoughts on like the services you've got in place at the moment? Yeah, so I think one of the points, <clears throat> sorry, I've just, I've been scribbling away as we've been going as well, and there's, uh, yeah, 101, going, 101 things in my head at the moment. About this. So the, the person who was talking about Young Futures and the response agreement to agree, uh, the response agreement to incidences and using those in a, um, kind of in a proactive approach. I think we do something internally called safety assessments, which is um, which is, is is essentially a risk assessment, but just in a more in more friendly language. Um, and that's kind of so we're still in the relatively early days of the transition from risk to safety assessments. But I think as we get better at them, generally, I can really see this helping. I think so. You know, kind of getting to know. A, a person's behavior so being up front with someone so trying to build the the trust and the relationship with them early on and if a person says oh look you know i can become quite frustrated if i'm told what not to do and it's you know kind of touching on sharon's point then well you know being trauma informed it just means that well, i'm trying to adapt the way that we maybe work with individuals to account for their kind of you know their their responses to situations um to get in there and saying well okay well if we need to if you know if you have done something which maybe goes against the rule or a good neighbor agreement or you have done something which has upset neighbors how how can we best approach that with you i think so yeah but moving it beyond a paperwork exercise and using it to you know share amongst share that knowledge amongst the team members that are working with that person to really make sure that as professionals going into situations not just the to properties, but to communities as well. Um, but yeah, we're not making the situation worse by not not listening to what they've told us. Completely, completely fair point, Oliver. I'm going to bring you in. Yeah, I think I think one of the one of the biggest biggest factors linking into the, the trauma informed element, and also, you know, not having a script for ASB is the is the practical proportionality. Um, I just think that becomes so huge in in a supported housing setting. You know, I can give an example of a lad who went into one of our properties and ripped the ceilings and walls down and he didn't get a warning letter because based on proportionality of him having extremely high level autism, the change of environment led him to want to tear the walls and ceilings down. From a proportionality perspective, that wouldn't be reasonable for us to take any action on that. Now, in a different setting, you know, general needs, for example, it may be proportionate to evict somebody for playing loud music. Now, on paper, the two kind of uh, offences, if you dub them, or antisocial behaviour, are worlds apart in terms of the severity. But because of the practicality and the proportionality, that kind of overrides everything in terms of the appropriateness and the reasonableness of your actions. And I think supported housing, so much of it, comes down to a, a judgment on proportionality, taking into account the level of need, how in control is somebody of their behaviour, and as a you know a reasonable and proper landlord, what what is the appropriate action to take in those circumstances? Definitely a balance and definitely a challenge. And, and as you've mentioned there, let's not get away from the fact there's some certainly some providers in this room and and Grant Oliver, I know you're you're but two of them you do support some of the most vulnerable people with some of the most high level needs who I, I like that idea of disproportionate, you know, the, the disproportionate angle, because, you know, one behavior for one person isn't acceptable to another, but is 
still understandable based on based on you know needs and and mental health and, and other and other aspects of it, it. Wayne, I'm going to come to you and then I'll jump to Sharon. But Wayne, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, hi mate. Um, yeah, it's obviously it's getting everybody on the same page as well. Isn't it? So when you're working with your, um, your professional services, um, understanding obviously the needs of the individuals, it's getting that transmitted from obviously your office staff to your frontline staff to your support workers. Um, if incidents happen, as obviously there's a lot of people obviously still using paper version stuff. Obviously, you know, Matt, I'm a big drive obviously for digitalisation um, of support notes and compliance and everything else. So once something happens, if everyone's on the same page, we also know then how to handle the situation a little bit better rather than going over the same stuff literally day in and day out. Um, so especially in Birmingham, we see seeing a lot of support staff um, where they're seeing this different individuals. So a lot of tenants are not seeing the same staff on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And it's so they're trying to explain obviously situations to them. And then next week they're seeing somebody completely different and just going over the same, same stuff. So I think once we come away from the paper version, um, support evidence and notes and go digitalization, I think obviously that'll be a massive increase and a massive benefit too. Certainly hope so. And I know we've talked about this before as well, that a lot of, a lot of time within supportive housing, some of the issues we have are that people don't know about needs until until someone arrives. Sharon, I'm going to bring you in. We've got two minutes left. I'm going to Sharon, Oliver. I'm going to be very, very quick. Just two quick things. Um, just on the back of what Oliver just said, it's, a, you know, having that understanding and knowledge and, and the person with autism, autism who you just mentioned then that goes back to what I was just sharing before about involving that charitable organization who who support who can support and and help you prepare that person for that move and so this is where we can get better pre and then just one more last thing uh, quickly Grant I just remembered another piece of training that I feel is really really useful and we all could benefit from it as a refresher which is about being able to have conversations not conflict you know, are we are we comfortable talking to people, and are we able to do that without leading into conflict? And as a professional, we really do need to have those skills. So that is just one last quick thing from me. Thank you very much, indeed, Oliver. Over to you. So I probably uh, brought this in a little bit too late. I was just interested to get some opinions. Uh, we'll temper this by saying I am like a bleeding heart liberal. Uh, are probably massively in the minority on this, but I, I really like providing ASTs in supported housing settings, even kind of low to medium support. I think it, I think the security of tenure for the tenant just leads to a better relationship, and I think it just regulates you as an organisation in terms of tackling ASB properly. I think what can happen in organisations when they issue licences, it's so easy to get rid of somebody. I just go down the, oh, yeah, we'll serve them a seven-day notice and they need to leave. And that's why I've always just had a preference for AST. It does make it much harder when you have a genuine ASB case, but I just think as an overall package, it's just so much better for the tenant. And as I say, kind of regulate you as an organisation in terms of taking the right approach to ASB. Have you heard what they've done in Wales recently with housing legislation, Oliver? No, no. <clears throat> so there's um it was well it's been in the pipeline for quite a few years now but it's um so it's called uh, the renting homes wales act um it's something like renting homes wales 2016 um so it's basically we've done away with um a short short hold tenancies everyone is now called contract holders um and where licenses are concerned we're only allowed to use licenses for the first six months after that, there's got to be um, there's criteria that's got to be met for it to be used. But even then, it can only be extended up to 12 months. So, for example, in some of the hostels and supported accommodation with me in the northeast, there's people that have been in our supported accommodation uh, hostels for like three years. So under Renting Homes Wells, they would automatically now have um, basically equivalent rights uh, as, as an, uh, someone on an AST. So it would be called something like a standard support contract. Um, so it's, it's a drastic change to housing legislation, a massive kind of thing for us all to have got our heads around. It was actually um, brought in at the 1st of December. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, huge changes for people. How about how an impact that had on the, the, the tenants and residents you've already got, Grant? Um, so the ones, that have, the ones that are already there, so ones that have been there for six months or more have automatically transferred from a license now to a standard support contract. I mean, at the moment, um, Although there's been lots of communication around this, people, I think we've got something like till May to actually get everybody's 
um, get everybody's contracts out to them. So there's still, I mean, it's a massive upheaval in housing legislation in Wales. So there's a tremendous amount of work going on in the background between our like housing compliance department and like lots of to and fro in with our solicitors as well. Um, you know, things like, you know, their keypad entries for everyone's rooms in the hostels um, under um, like a normal standard support contract, people would be able to change their own locks. Um, so there was all kinds of like all kinds of grey areas with this, and it, I think as with any new um, new piece of legislation, there are lots of different interpretations as of it as well. So what we understood as a you know as a homelessness charity, our solicitor maybe said something different, but then one of our RSL partners thought, oh, actually, I thought it meant this. So we're still yeah. I think ask us again December twenty twenty three. Yeah, and we might have a we might have a different idea. I'm going to bring Sharon Harvey in because we haven't had you today. Sharon, so we thought, well, why not? It's always nice to have a new face. And go on, that's for you. Yeah, hi. I'm um, fine, thanks. Um, I've now moved from supported housing into general needs, to be honest. Um, but I, most of my um, housing has always been in supported housing accommodation. And it's interesting because of um, the last position I was in for 11 years, I was responsible for homeless hostels under the YMCA movement. I won't say which particular YMCA. And yeah, we were on licenses and they are still on licenses. And I agree, um, a short short hold is better for the tenant. However, if you're not in a position to do that because the executive team won't go down that road, the easiest way is to look at your eviction policy and basically increase it to make it harder for a young person to technically become evicted, even on the license agreement. I was also in a position where I ended up doing the appeals. So if a young person was issued a seven day NTQ or, or 28 day NTQ, and they didn't feel it was just, just, they obviously could appeal. And I'll be honest with you, because I was away from the operations day to day running of the schemes and I was more strategic, I would often, you know, uplift the NTQ, so the so the young person would end up in the host, in back in the hostel, and I would then have a word with the frontline worker. And what I would often find is the frontline workers generally it's personality clashes with the young person, and it's their easy way out of getting rid of a young person they don't want to obviously manage anymore. And obviously, therefore, training would then be put in place with that member of staff. So there are things if you're not in a position to move from a license to a short short hold, there are things you can do strategically to actually help and support the young person, um, especially when you're no longer on the day to day front line. Um, and it is about, you know, I went into supported housing to support young people to actually make a difference to them. Um, and then when organisation changes, restructures, so the reason why I changed the eviction policy um, to make it harder um, was primarily because my line manager was changing and I knew he had a zero tolerance on the ASB and it's like, no, that's not going to work because you're coming away from another provision within the organisation to support it and we need to be demonstrating to the local authority that we are providing support to these young people. So, so there are other ways of getting around it, but yeah, everything that everyone's mentioned today, PI, tra trauma, you know, trauma informed approach is everything that was being implemented when I was back within the YMCA um, surface that I used to oversee. I think it, the, there's so much I think this, this topic covers. I think so much comes down to training and understanding. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. your insight and, and what's happened there, you know, particularly with the, the, the story and the change that's happened with yourself. Uh, Jesse's mentioned in the, um, in the chat that it's true, it's a balance, recognising the impact on staff too, was recognising the imbalance of power, and then we have to be accountable and evidence careful considerations. Um, a few people have had to go. I know that I'm going to kind of wrap up today because we could no doubt keep going on and on and on here. Um, but I just want to say thank you to Grant for bringing the, the conversation to the table today. Thank you to everyone who, who has an input and an insight into, into the conversation. It's clearly one that needs to continue. It's really interesting to hear how the legislative change goes, Grant, through, through obviously the course of this year, because that sounds like it's really going to shake things up. Um, but more importantly, I think it's time that we just really kind of look 
and, and it's happening right across housing in general anyway, is remembering we're dealing with people, not properties. And I think that's the thing. Um, whilst also knowing that you are going to, that, that disproportionate idea that Oliver had earlier really needs to be written into policy and, and into everything that we're doing, because evidently one person's success uh, is is evidently not, not the same for everyone else. So, uh, sorry, someone's just putting something in a different chat. Um, next week's roundtable is going to be, I'm just having a quick look on here, uh, Claire Foraker is joining us. Conversation is going to be around mergers and what's going on there. So do join us if you'd like to or to sign up to what's going on with the roundtable. Please feel free to just reach out to my profile and have a shout. But for now, thank you, Grant. Hope you enjoyed that today. I did. No, really helpful today, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really no appreciate it. And the recording will be available very soon. Take care, all. Cheers. Bye-bye. Right.